da, da, da. Good morning, everybody. It is a lovely day, and I am super pumped about today because we are going to get rid of people you don't need. So today we're talking about AI, Captain Kirk, people you just don't need in your life, people you really do need in your life. And of course, we're going to talk about how the Wright brothers made it, actually made it to Mars. We're going to be talking about that. So we're going to be talking about a lesson today. We're going to be talking about other news today. But before all of that, you know what time it is. It's time for a morning cup of gratitude. Let's do this thing. Mm, 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 mm. So I want to hear this morning what you are stinking grateful for. Man, today my heart is just full of gratitude. I got a lot to be grateful for today. One of the main things I'm grateful for uh, is just a good night's rest. I don't know about you, but when stuff hits the fan, when life hits the fan and it messes you up, nothing like a good night's rest does it. The other thing I'm grateful for is my mother-in-law, Yvette. Ah, I wish I could have tagged her. Here, let me just tag her. Yvette, boom, grateful Ooh, for you. Boom. Uh, she actually showed me an exercise. I had back pain that I thought was kidney pain. And she showed me an exercise and I did it. And this has been plaguing me for weeks. It's been limiting my workouts. I've been gaining weight. And I found this exercise from a vet and it totally loosened it up. And today I have like total mobility. That's huge. I'm surrounded by good people. And that idea is really what is dominating my thoughts today. I'm surrounded by extraordinary people. And we're going to talk more about that. So what I'm mostly grateful for is how many good people I've managed to, whether by design, decision, or just destiny, how I've been able to be surrounded by such good people and how life will on its own accord purge any of the people I'm just not, not needing. So I'm super grateful for that today. What are you grateful for? I want to hear in the comments what you are absolutely grateful for today. Tell me, and how can you even start a day without gratitude? How can you get through a day without gratitude? I don't know, but I'd love to hear from you. And I don't care who you are. I'd love to hear from you what you're grateful for. Put it in the comments. Let's talk about other news. Here we go. News that's uplifting, news that rounds you out as a human, news that takes you to the stars and takes you to your inner life. Let's talk about this. So William Shatner, that's right, Captain Kirk himself, boom, William Shatner, here you go, celebrates his 90th birthday by loading himself into the Matrix. Yes, you heard that correct. So Captain Kirk, who doesn't have... A solid place in their heart for William Shatner. For the most part, he has been able to stay away from most drama in his life. And he is now creating an interactive AI for himself. Now, he was quoted as saying, this is for all of my children and all of my children's children and all of my children's loved ones and all of the loved ones of the loved ones. This is my gift down through time. So what has generally been a speculative, total hypothetical possibility is now being done first and foremost at the consumer level by the illustrious actor William Shatner himself. A company by the name of Story Life has created an artificial intelligence and they were very clear to say this is not what we call true AI avatar. This is not what we call a deep fake. There is an AI algorithm, and the AI algorithm is meant to interpret the questions being asked by people. But what comes out of that is either a hologram, a VR, or a uh, two-dimensional uh, digital uh, real conversation with William Shatner. So he will actually go through intensive questioning up and down across his life. They're going to do extensive hours and hours of interviewing. And then AI will take that into its database and 
re, uh, read it and categorize that and then pair that with lots of different ways people could ask the questions. And then it will go through a series of testing where interviewers will ask the AI a question. It will serve up an answer in the rank whether or not it was accurate or inaccurate. And then the AI will learn very quickly. And eventually this will be put into a museum or at least at the family level where people in family can actually queue up Granddad Shatner and ask it questions. How was your life? What was it like acting in Star Trek? What did you love most about it? What what should I do about dating? What should I do about life? And William Shatner's hours and hours of uh, um, uh, interviews will be served up by this AI. So it's instead of a conversational video of the real Shatner uh, answering questions. So if you want to learn more about consumer grade AI and how you can truly at least, well, mostly upload your who-ness, this isn't the same as uploading your consciousness necessarily, which is something I'm still holding out for, but it is about uploading your who-ness. And I would love to at least do this for my nieces, my nephews, my family, where we actually answer these things. And guess what? Maybe we could actually do a rudimentary version where Marissa or the team ask me questions and I just we just put the answers on our YouTube and on our blog and they just ask questions of a coach. We might actually do that. I'm going to earmark that because I actually think that might be my most rudimentary way to load my consciousness. Questions for Grant. Here we go. Boom. I'm doing it. Questions. There we go. That's going to happen, my friends. All right. Let's talk about how the... Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, actually, really, are making it to Mars. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, you heard me correctly. Here, let's pull this up. Boom, boom, let's do that. Boom, all right, let's close that. There we go. So the NASA helicopter known as Ingenuity is about to take its... Whoop, it's about to... Here we go. What's going on? Let's do this. Let's do this. Boom, there we go is about to actually make it to Mars. So we have the rover, the Perseverance rover, which is on Mars. And we've known that there's a helicopter attached, known as the Ingenuity rover. I believe the design itself was actually created by high schoolers, but I could be mistaken on that. And NASA knows the symbol of first flight. So we have landed on Mars. We've had roser, rovers on Mars. We have orbitals around Mars. We now have Martian geologists here on Earth actually doing research and science to discover that there's ice flows and there's water underneath the surface of Mars, speculating how to construct buildings. But we're about to take a major milestone, and that is humans' first flight or humanity's first flight on Mars. Now, the Ingenuity helicopter is attached to the underside of the Perseverance rover. And the Ingenuity uh, helicopter, once the Perseverance rover arrives at a space on the surface that they have deemed right as an airstrip, they will then lower the Ingenuity helicopter. And as it lowers underneath its solar panel, Ingenuity is a basically a self-charging, solar-powered helicopter. Underneath the solar panel is a tiny piece of fabric. This tiny piece of fabric is about the size of a postage stamp. And this postage stamp size piece of fabric is actual fabric from the original plane that the Wright brothers used in their inaugural flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903, over a hundred years ago. It's delivered to its Martian airfield underneath the solar panel on the Ingenuity helicopter. The rover itself, once the Perseverance rover deposits it, the rover itself will back up from a perspective underneath an outcropping, and it will begin to take photos and video of the first flight and the helicopter is going to do a test flight. It's going to do several test flights and then it's actually going to fly around the airstrip and make its first official flight on Mars. And guess what? We can see that thing. And this is actually going to tell us based on the atmospheric conditions and the wind is flight as we understand it even possible on Mars. And so I just ask you this, if a bunch of nerd alert scientists 
understand the emotional importance of symbols, of talismans, how much more should we in our daily lives take a hold of symbols, of myth, of the symbology that stirs our hearts? Because you know that when that Ingenuity helicopter makes its first flight and they know that canvas uh, of the actual wings from the Orville and Wilbur Wright airplane that took off on Kitty Hawk, from that very first to today, we are now taking the first flight on Mars. If this is going to make Mars or NASA scientists cheer, how much more should we be adding symbols like that to the goals in our own life? Did you get a tattoo? Did you get a piece of jewelry that symbolized that thing? Do you have a necklace that symbolizes the thing you are trying to become? I recommend you do and create symbols for you and your team. I dropped the link there in the comments so that you can actually check out the article on how the Wright brothers actually truly made it to Mars. And that, my friend, is other news that elevates your soul. Uh, uh. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So let's talk about things that destroy your soul and then things that build your soul back up. So I was reading this morning. Um, we had an encounter with a friend of ours, a contact of ours, who several times now has um, had trouble uh, with the police. And this was stirring me about the type of people you surround yourself with. And this person, though they are a good person, and though this person um, – has been had setbacks in their life. They're just not surrounded by enough uplifting people. And I was challenging myself, how can I be an uplifting person in this person's life? And challenging myself about that and then taking inventory of my own life. And in taking inventory of my own life, asking myself, what are the type of people I absolutely need in my life? And what are the type of people I don't? Yesterday, if you look into my feed, and for uh, posterity's sake, if you're seeing this, just scroll down in my feed a little bit. I posted about Adam Welchel and how Adam Welchel is a bold person. And I love the fact that Adam Welchel is bold because he has far surpassed any business accomplishments I have ever had. He's far surpassed any musical talents I've ever desired. He's done a lot. He's built an extraordinary family. He's built extraordinary investments. He's fought through many of his demons and continues to, I would call Adam Welchel a bold person. And though we do not spend the time that I would adore to spend, I am grateful that I count this person as someone in my circles. Other people who exhibit things like this, Chris McLaughlin is a brilliant person. And this person has been around in my life and though we have never spent the amount of time I wish we spent together, but Chris McLaughlin is a brilliant person. There's been bold people. There's been strong people. Eddie Allen is what I would consider a strong person in my circles. The list could go on and on. Laura Helm, a strong, brilliant, she calls it grit. What does she call it? Grit and guts or something like this. She has this phrase, grit and grace. I'm sorry, the opposite of guts. Grit and grace is the mantra that Laura Helm has had in her business. She is brilliant. She is bold. People like this in my life who I have a massive amount of respect for. I take inventory and think I have not spent nearly enough time being what those people need in my own life and then being what uh, they are in my life. And I want more of it. So then I got to thinking of, man, who are the people that bring you down? Who are the people that actually sacrifice your goals for their own desires, securities, and ambition? So in this pursuit of asking this question and journaling, I actually am reading a book right now. I totally recommend this, The Motivation Manifesto. If you have not gotten this book, I recommend it by the illustrious Brendan Bruchard. So these, these types of people that you do not need in your life, Brendan Bruchard codified it, and I am adopting it wholeheartedly. Brendan Bruchard says, you need to remove the warriors, the weaklings, and the wicked. You need to remove the warriors, the weaklings, and the wicked. Let's touch on this. Today's for today's lesson, and I'm going to give you a few tidbits to how I interpreted this in my own life and what I think you what these people sound like, 
which of these people are more or least likely to damage your life, the risk that they pose on you, the antidote, and what you should add to your life instead. Let's cover it. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Got a great radio station going back there. I'm loving it. So here we go. The Warriors. The Warriors sound like they love you. The Warriors sound like they love you. They sound like they're trying to protect you. They sound like they're trying to look out for your good. Maybe they're actually looking out for their own good too. Maybe you're partnered with them. Maybe they're kids. Maybe they're spouses. Maybe they're cousins or siblings or co-workers or business partners. They sound like they love you. They sound like they're trying to protect you. Now, these are most likely to steal your destiny. They're most likely to steal your destiny because they sound like a friend or a loved one. They sound like they're looking out for you. They sound like they have solid advice, but they are most likely to steal your dream in their life. Now, the risk here with warriors is that their anxieties and their fears low-key seep into you unknowingly. Why? Because you love them too. You love your business partners. You love your spouses. You love your siblings. You love your family. You love your parents. You love your kids. I have to thank God that both my parents always encouraged me, both my dad and my mom. In spite of all of our ups and downs, a major powerhouse for my family is that they constantly encourage me to be bold. Warriors don't do that. They sound like they're looking out for you. And the risk is that eventually as you consider them and consider their advice, slowly that seeps into you and you begin, you'll wake up one day a warrior. You'll wake up one day full of fear, full of anxiety, not really sure you know what to do. And you never really knew what to do before, but it didn't bother you. Now, when you think about it, well, I don't know what to do. And that now becomes a worry or a fear or an anxiety. That is the risk of keeping worriers close to you. So here's the antidote. The antidote is this. Love them, but boldly continue to speak about your goals and dreams. When they say, well, I don't think you know about this, this, and this. And you say, I don't care. I can find out. And I'm still going to do this. Be their boldness. Because here's the thing. These people need bold people in their life. You are their boldness. And they're actually pushing it back to you so that you continue to bring boldness to them. Now, you might, because you love them, think, well, if I'm too bold, I'm going to push them away. If I'm too bold, I'm going to shut them down. If I'm too, if I continue on this path, maybe they're right. And that line of thinking over a long enough period of time is what will make you weak yourself as a worrier. It will actually steal your destiny because their anxiety and their fear will suddenly be your mental loops if you keep them too close. So the antidote is to love them, but boldly. Now I say antidote. This doesn't prevent worry and fear from seeping in. This is the antidote. Let's talk about how to actually prevent future invasions of worry and anxiety. But the antidote is to love them, but to continue to boldly speak your dreams. This is what I'm going to do. And then to take action on it. Doesn't matter if you have answers to their questions or not. What matters is that you move forward boldly. So here is what you do instead. Add more people to your life who speak of things beyond their reach. When you know that they've never gone somewhere, but they're starting to talk about going in a direction, celebrate them. Don't become a worrier or an anxiety source for them. Encourage them. Ask them how they're going to learn about this or fill in this gap and take it to the next level. If you see gaps in their dream, don't poke holes. Don't be that person. If you see holes in their dream, encourage them, celebrate them and say, okay, let's strategize this. How can I help? How can I help bridge this gap? How can I help bridge that gap? When they try new things and speak up for the little guy or speak up for themselves, note it. Hey, I recognize that you're bold. I recognize that you're stepping up. I recognize that you are taking leaps into stuff you don't know. That's awesome. Surround yourselves with them. The reason I think you should celebrate them is because that's what you need in your life. And by celebrating them, you will add people like that to their life. And then they will celebrate you. When you say, I'm going to start this whole new trend, Ryan, Ryan Odenweller um, has several times announced, hey, I'm going to become a speaker. And people are like, well, you don't have the it factor. Man, who would do that? Plenty of people would do that. You don't have the it factor, buddy. 
And he keeps pushing. So I celebrate people who step out because I need that more in my life. One of the types of people you don't need in your life are warriors. The antidote is to love them, but boldly continue to speak about your dreams and pursue them. Take action. And then how to prevent future seepage of anxiety and fear is every time you see someone step out, even if they were the person who was poking holes in you before, note it. Be a good finder. Look for something you can celebrate. Even in the people who are antagonistic to your life, look for places they're bold and encourage it. Encourage it. Get behind it. Lift them up. Say, man, that is awesome what you're doing. That's how you deal with warriors, and that's how you add the bold. So you need to remove warriors, and you need to add those who are bold in your life. You need to do it. Number two, weaklings. They sound like doubters questioning your life work, questioning, well, should we work this hard? Should we, shouldn't we be having more fun? Shouldn't we be more leisurely? Now, this is really where this is coming from is I do believe we should be having more fun. I enjoy the work. I love the work. I love building things. I love going places. I also like having fun, but no, not nearly as much as I like doing the work. But this is the old um, Br'er Rabbit sort of world of the grasshopper that was always having fun at the cost of preparing for the winter. So they sound like they're questioning, well, we, we shouldn't be doing this. You, you work too hard. You're a workaholic. You're not getting anywhere. Ugh. It's not even true. We are getting somewhere. If nothing more, we're building character. But we are getting somewhere. We're just not getting to where you want to get. They sound like doubters. They sound like they question whether or not you're even the work you're doing is even worth it. And yes, you don't need to be operating on poor strategies. You need to be improving your strategies. But you can't do that if you're not working. They always want to steal the energy, to steal the work. They want to take it easy. There, there's a moderate. If warriors have a high likelihood of stealing your destiny, weaklings have a moderate likelihood of stealing your destiny because they speak about taking it easy. They speak about resting more. And then once you rest, there's nothing productive in the rest. Recreation and rest should be constructive. It should be building you up. It should be informing your worldview. It should be drawing or painting, or it still should be creative in nature. But if it's just Netflix and chill, if it's just bumming around and not getting anywhere, this is how you can spot a weakling. They sound like doubters. They're questioning whether or not you should even be doing what you're doing. When And again, like I don't mean your advisors. Your advisors are different. The people you trust could be like, hey, they're not questioning the work ethic. They're questioning the strategy. Hey, I love how hard you work, but let's maybe modify like this. That's good work. I love your ambition. And then they do say, are you taking time for yourself? And if you are, they recognize that too. But it's often really the beef people have when they question is often the strategy. Maybe we should be deploying a new strategy, but the MO of applying ourselves. And I, again, I am not talking about risking the good life. We could compare this to the good life at another date. But I'm talking about you filtering out weaklings in your life. So they sound like doubters and they question your work ethic. They question uh, in terms of you being a workaholic and working too much. And they speak way too much about leisure and escape. There's a moderate likelihood that they steal your destiny because even though you love them, you and your heart know what it takes to achieve your dream. You and I know the amount of effort you have to put in to achieve your dream. In Marissa's case, it's hiking. That's her dream. She knows when she's cutting herself short. She should have been hiking the hills this morning. I'm not going to shame her. She knows she should have, but she slept in. But she is fully aware that, man, I really should be putting in the work, man. It's going to hurt once I get out on the trail if I don't train a bit more. They talk about taking it easy way too much. Now, the risk is this. We also slowly begin to believe that maybe taking it easy is a better MO. Maybe the maybe I'm mistaken that that the goals I have take this much work. Now, Marissa wants to go outside, and for all intents and purposes, people could say, "Well, look at her; she just wants to go outside and not work." Well, that's not really it. Like she should be up at five in the morning, really grinding it out. She should be out at the gym in the afternoon, really grinding it out. That's not taking it easy. She's putting in the effort. Olympians. 
mountain climbers. These people are all training for something, right? That's not taking it easy. If you're an artist, you do want to get through your day's work so that at you know noon or 2 p.m. you can pivot and go do your passion. That's not taking it easy. I'm talking about laziness. The risk is that we begin to believe that sitting on the beach drinking Mai Tais and being lazy is the path to bliss. I believe there is a path to bliss, and I believe it's not on the other side of uh, workaholism. But I believe if your bliss is painting, you'll work morning, noon, and night. Do I believe this phrase, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life? Not necessarily for nuanced reasons, but at the principle level, I believe it. If you're following your bliss, you're not going to work a day in your life. Marissa might struggle whether or not she should get out and do the hills, do the workouts. But once she gets out there, she loves it. Once she gets out there, it's difficult, but she loves it. She loves when she comes home sweaty from the gym. She loves when she's put in the time on the hills. Yeah, she might struggle to get out there and do it. But that's evidence of when you do what you love, you never work a day in your life, right? That's not laziness. The risk of weaklings in our life is that we suddenly begin, well, maybe my blissed out Zen life, maybe peace is on the other side of laziness, and it just isn't. The antidote is to love them, listen to them the way they probably seem like they're listening to you, but guard your heart against their energy. You got to guard your heart against their energy. You want to listen to them because you do want to hear people when they say, hey, you're working too hard. You do want to listen. Am I working too hard? Maybe I'm working too hard at the wrong strategy. Maybe I'm putting in too much time. Maybe I should be pursuing other pursuits. But they're also going to push further and be like, yeah, man, it's all good. We don't have, nothing matters. It's all, once we die, it's all going to vaporize anyway. <clears throat> Listen, that sort of thinking, that needs to take a hike. That is actually the path to laziness. My friend Eli, he actually wrestled with nihilism for a long time. Nothing I do matters or lasts. That's true. But then he came back on the other side of this and realized, but I still have to do meaningful work when I'm alive. I still have to be challenged. I still need to gamify myself. I still have to take things to the next level. So he got in school and is pursuing being a teacher, being a counselor in psychology. He's not taking the easy, lazy way out. He's just finding something he's fine at grinding at. And he knows when to pause. He knows when to play games. He knows when to do some creative recreation, but it's not laziness. The risk is that we become lazy. We start to believe, maybe I should be taking it easy. That's never true. You should be applying yourself at all times. Just find the right thing to apply yourself at. So instead of surrounding yourself with weaklings, surround yourself with those who exhibit discipline, with those who exhibit strength, with those who exhibit stick to with those who exhibit endurance, with those, and they might only be able to endure a five-minute workout, but they get up and they do it. They get up and they push. They might come up to the brink and go, should I or shouldn't I? I'm going to do it. And they might gas out entirely. But those who keep getting up, the Rudy of the world, those who applaud the effort you give, those who never accuse you of uh, workaholism, but say, hey, you're doing real good. Should you take some downtime? Maybe. But they never, they never chip away at your work ethic. Ditch those who chip away at your work ethic. Those who applaud your work ethic and those who encourage you, hey, we need some downtime. We need to let off some steam. Great. Let's go do that. Those who encourage you to go further, do more and verbalize that because they know what it takes to pay dues because they're paying dues on their own thing. And they can see when you're paying dues on yours and they do it for themselves. Pull these, what I call brawny people. If you need to look out for warriors and weaklings, you need to draw to you the bold and what I'm calling the brawny, those who have a sturdiness to their soul once they're doing the thing they love. Last but not least, what Brennan Burchard calls the wicked. Now, these people sound like, what do they sound like? They're obviously negative. They're obviously tearing other people down. They're obviously being judgmental. They're obviously like side-eyeing people. These are the least likely to steal your destiny, though they're the loudest. These are the least likely because they're obvious. The risk with the wicked is that you fall under their scrutiny. For some reason, they lock in on you, that you end up on their radar for antagonism. They'll try to undermine you. They'll try to antagonize you. Me and Marissa are pretty good at avoiding these people. I've only met one or two in the last 10 years who are genuinely, sincerely bad people. 
Now, the antidote for them is simply don't do business with them. Avoid them whenever possible. Do not placate them. Do not give in to their bullying. Stand up to them, but do not allow them to their life. If, if something like that starts to happen, the antidote is to not placate them, not give in to their bullying, but don't do business with them. Cut them off. And instead, instead of the wicked in your life, start replacing them with the brilliant. Abundant people who are can-do, who know that if there's not enough pie, we're just going to bake a bigger pie. If there's not enough pie to dole out to everybody, let's just bake a bigger pie. Surround yourself with high caliber, highly intelligent people. This will be a moat against attacks of the wicked. I've had someone come up and start criticizing me in a big way a few years back. They started saying that I was doing this, that, or the other, and it came back to me. Grant does things. He takes shortcuts to do this or that. It came back to me because I was surrounded by brilliant people. They called and said, hey, I heard this. Is this true? A brilliant person will check the facts and confront you when confronted with a fact. And that barrier is around you. And as other people say, oh, so-and-so is talking about Grant. So-and-so is talking about you. Is that true? And then that person will come to your defense and be like, no, I know Grant. No, I know what that person's like. No, I know that caliber. No, they're not perfect, but they're, that what their person's saying is not true. I'm sure you've come under other people's scrutiny. The best moat in your life to the scrutiny of others is to be surrounded by the brilliant, especially as it comes to the wicked, especially as it comes to those who so ill will because of their own insecurities. So Brennan Bouchard said, you got to look out for the worriers. They sound like your friends and loved ones, and they're the highest risk in your life because you make room for them in your life but their anxiety and worries could get into you. Brennan Bouchard said, look out for weaklings because you might start to believe, well, maybe I am working too hard. No, that's never true. You could be working too hard at the wrong strategy, but applying your wholeness to something, that's never, never the answer. But you could, it could seep in and you could start to believe maybe working hard isn't the answer. No, working hard at the thing you love and the thing you love might change. You're allowed to shift directions. Don't shift gears. And for those who come into your life who can help you with that, they'll say other things. We'll cover that in a second. And, and the wicked, Brendan Bouchard called out the wicked, these people who are obvious, and they don't stand a high risk of ruining your life, but you don't need them. Instead, I want to I want to challenge you to be bold and add bold people. To be brawny and strong and to add brawny and strong people and celebrate them. And to be brilliant, to add brilliant people, smart people into your life to counteract the negative forces of the people in your life. The antidote is simple. Love each of these people, but don't let their energy seep in. Listen to them, but not too long. And then get right back to the antidote. If you have a session with someone who's a worrier and they just so worry and you can feel it creeping up, Call your bold friends right away. Just say, hey, how are you doing? Just checking in with you. What's going on? Speak into my life. And they'll say, I was out doing this bold thing and I was out and I came across this challenge and I pushed through and you're just going to get fed with that energy. Reach out to the antidote people in your life so that they speak life into you. I hope this was helpful to you today. Sorry I missed Monday. I love you guys. Sorry we didn't see each other yesterday. But listen, if you need any help out there, building up your own life. You're always welcome to visit us at State of the Spark. If you want to carry on conversations like this, visit us at the Facebook Goals and Gratitude Group. But no matter what today, remember the vision, remember the mission, igniting lies of explosive significance, starting with your own.